You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. Yo, dog, I heard you like interest rate cuts. How can a Ponzi scheme last 27 years? And the latest, the IRS Coinbase saga. All this and more on episode 188 here on December 28th, 2016. Darren? In the traditional markets, we have gold up to uh, $1,142. Silver's up to $15.98. Oil is up to, at $53.62. The Dow Jones is down for the first time since the election, uh, still at a high uh, level of 19833 The 30-year Treasury yield drops uh, to 3.094. The euro is steady at uh, buying a buck oh four, and the Chinese yuan will buy you 14 cents, and the British pound uh, continues a downward trend to to uh, buying one dollar and twenty two cents. Yeah, the Brits are getting beat up. Still, this Brexit thing is haunting them, and it's and they haven't even left yet. So, moving on in the crypto markets, Bitcoin is climbing to nine hundred and seventy dollars. Wow! That will it reach a thousand by the year's end? Who knows? Dun dun dun. Yeah, I've, uh, I've seen bets on will uh, Bitcoin hit a thousand or will the Dow Jones hit twenty thousand first? Oh, Ooh. well, Bitcoin has already hit a thousand. So, jokes on you, Dow Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Litecoin is at Rises to four dollars and thirty-seven cents. Zcash is up for the first time in weeks to fifty dollars and seventy cents. In fact, obviously it has up and downs all along the way. But as we report on it, I think it's only gone down since we first started talking about it. Right. Uh, Dash is up to ten dollars and twenty-two cents. Ethereum is down to seven dollars and fifty-five cents. Noteworthy because it's the only coin that's down this week. Uh, Monero jumps to fourteen dollars and ten cents. Amazing jump. It was a uh, Probably like a 40% increase over oh, last wow. week. That's so wow. And one doge is it still equals to one doge. And just a reminder, you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, High Heart Radio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, Library, and more. Excellent. Wow. Thank you, Randy. All the and places. just to note, this is Randy's uh, last episode for Randy for a few weeks. He's going uh, to be going on a vacation, and we'll be out of studio but uh, we I'll be back. we we should note that our our show numbers have been better than ever this month. We set a new record for downloads over the month, and it's not and this is, show hasn't even been out yet. So um, thank you so much, Randy, for all the help you've given us. The SEO I think has been great, and we really appreciate your contribution Aww, to New Cash Radio. Um, and to start out, Randy has a really interesting story about a 27-year-old Russian Ponzi scheme. Randy, what's what's happening here? It's called MMM, uh, and it stands for Mavrodi Mundial Movement. This might be a name that could be familiar to some. Uh, this was something that started in the early 1990s um, in Russia, and the founder, Sergei Mavrodi, uh, at the time was using these big advertising campaigns and stuff to promote it in Russia to try and get more people to come in. And basically, it crumbled in 1997, and there were millions of Russians uh, believed to be out over $100 million U.S. equivalent, basically. Um, what he managed to do was still rally these people who so believed in this system and basically said, if you get me elected to the state parliament, like I'll give you guys tax breaks and all this kind of stuff. And he actually got voted in and gave himself immunity uh, from punishment, wow. which was which was eventually overturned, and he was sent to prison for four and a half years. Um, and act actually, he had been he was being held for that long before his trial, and by the time his trial was done, he would served most of his sentence, so he was let go a little bit after that. Well, about three years after getting out of jail, he launched a, a new form called MMM 2011 and MMM 2012, uh, still using the same name. He was just a lot more open about it. Um, said and he said, "quote This is a pyramid. It is a naked scheme. Nothing more. People interact with each other and give each other money for no reason." And wow. basically, it's it, just upfront about it. Yeah. Well, what it's set up to do now, and and the reason it's in the news again is because it's taking over. Uh, it, it's it's spreading like wildfire in Africa. It's gone through China and India, and it's been banned there. Uh, there was a problem in South Africa earlier this year, and he, uh, the the same founder, same name. This is being used now with uh, digital cryptocurrencies, with things like Bitcoin, and they're introducing a coin of their own called Mavros or Mavro coins. Um, and this is something that they just started breathing new life into uh, just a few days ago. Uh, but it's got scam written all over it. There's no white paper. 
Uh, they do have a blockchain, but it doesn't. It just shows transactions going across. There's there's nothing showing what's actually happening. Uh, it's just a lot of marketing talk and promised returns, which is your red flag right there. I mean, they keep talking about these uh, 30 to 70 percent per month increases and things like that. Right. So the, the scam is that you pay a fee when you join. Uh, they're calling it a mutual aid society where you are directly as it's been going now, it's been bank payments or Bitcoin, but you are sending money directly to someone's account. So someone posts that they want to uh, provide help. That's what they're calling it when you join. You provide, offer to provide help, and someone else that's already in the network is eligible to get help after they've provided help to someone else. And so after a little bit of time's gone by, they're basically, if I were to join and say, uh, provide you help of $100, Dar- Darren or JJ. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> I would get the equivalent in these Mavro coins, and I guess they are controlling either the supply or the exchange rate or any of these other things, but after a certain amount of time, you are then able to uh, request help for that amount. So you would get your initial investment back by someone else joining um, and, and providing you this help, and you are also eligible to get whatever amount of interest. And that number varies based on your uh, how much you participate. So if you bring more people in, you get more percentage points. If you post a video, what they call a letter of happiness that shows, you know, you telling about how you spent your money that you got, uh, you can get more percentage points. So it's very, very referral based. It's very, wow. It's a classic Ponzi. It's evolved though. It's evolved. The the original idea of the Ponzi that, that, that struck me was it, it preyed upon the family bond sort of thing. Like uh, if you have a, a, a nephew or a sister or brother, someone in your family is doing a fundraiser and they come to you, hey, I buy a calendar. This just happened recently at a, a holiday party I'd went to uh, and someone was approached to buy a calendar to help support the team that this, this uh, kid played for. And the calendar, of course, is, you know, you, you have a chance to win a raffle and, and you know, it, there's drawings all and it's listed in the calendar when the drawings are and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's really a way to, to raise money, okay? But it, it's more likely for you to say yes to this person because they're a, a family member, right? Someone in your, that you care about. Now, like the same bond being used to, to sell these products because it's mostly word-of-mouth sales from one individual who knows someone else. Right. And it's like, it's communities that are connected. So it's it's usually a family member or a close friend. And, and like, it just seems like it's really exploiting that aspect of the community it very much so and and some of the articles i've been reading this week uh talk a lot about i mean they are talking to this is huge in nigeria right now so it collapsed in zimbabwe in in september it collapsed in south africa and in south africa it was something they were calling uh mmm republic of bitcoin and this was focusing very heavily obviously on bitcoin um and and their statement there when that closed was we regret we regret to inform you that we have to close down the republic of bitcoin it was an experiment and unfortunately it failed we turned out not to be able to pay 100 percent per month (laughs) it's like well gee i wonder how long you know if if people aren't paying in i mean referrals are the only that's not a that's not an experiment that's just bad math (laughs) right yeah if referrals are your only base of new income then it's going to fail as soon as people stop coming in exponential growth to sustain something like this and eventually you run out of people yeah and to be fair uh, what what i like a little bit about Mavrodi being open at least like we were saying earlier is that much of his disdain is to central banks and he's kind of saying you know central banking fractional reserve banking is a pyramid scheme in and of itself and at least you're going to get better returns off of this one it's kind of until it shuts down so so is he trying to make the argument this is this is more like micro loans than uh, a pyramid mutual aid society is what they're what they're saying people helping people and and from what it appears you know i don't know how they're i don't know how he's making money on any of this because it and it same all the other all the articles I've been reading seem to say the same, and it's that people are making these these account or these uh, withdrawals and deposits direct to each other without intermediaries. His big thing is he does not like banks, so I don't know what the incentive is or or whatnot. But um, so you're saying this is a scam? I I do believe so, and and back to Nigeria, they're saying that there's about 3 million users and it's the fifth most visited website in Nigeria right now, like basically after you know Google and a few others. But um, anyway, on on, Feb- on December 13th, they froze all of the accounts without any advanced knowledge, uh, 
you know, just came, all of a sudden they froze all the accounts, uh, claiming it was to deal with heavy Christmas and holiday traffic, and they said they will be reopening them after one month, but there's a whole lot of panic. Uh, Nigeria is in the middle of a really bad recession. They're worse than decades. Banks aren't lending money out, and people are, have been flocking to sort of anything that's being able to provide capital. And so when there's people posting these videos of themselves receiving, right? you know, it, it, yeah, what you were saying about taking advantage of that, but... Uh, yeah, my advice is to stay away from any anything resembling a Ponzi scheme, of course, but MMM and these Mavro coins. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Randy. Sure. Excellent. Well, central banks are like, yo, dog, I heard you like cutting interest rates. There's a CNBC article that we'll have posted on our blog here. But the core takeaway that I get is that uh, the article says the top 50 central banks around the world have seen a total of 690 interest rate cuts since the collapse collapse of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008, according to data from J.P. Morgan Asset Management. This means one rate cut every three trading days. They're gonna, they, the article ends the uh, sentence with, they're going to run out of ammunition soon. And Darren, I mean, how much lower can some of these places cut? Well, uh, the UK just went negative last week. and uh, uh, <laughs> So they're going negative. Yeah. So uh, and, and there's certainly a limit. Uh, eventually, people will just start dropping uh, their their currency if the if if negative interest rates get too severe. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. and we we um, and there's also a, a limit on how many treasuries can be bought. Uh, we have Japan taking over China or overtaking China as the largest holder of U.S. treasuries. So that's that's something interesting that happened uh, the past week. Yeah. And uh, well, Japan was always a big lender for the United States and has been, of course, mm-hmm. but they're having their own troubles. Yeah. So it, it can only stand a reason that yeah. there's only so much support they can give. Yeah, there's negative interest rates in uh, Japan, too. Wow. So, so negative interest. Are you saying that the trend <laughs> indicates negative interest rates will be coming to the United States? No. No, I, you don't I, think so? I, I don't think so because of the way the U.S. is structured. It's It's kind of the 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 it's at the top of the pyramid so okay. to speak and i i don't think that uh negative interest rates would work like they do in other countries i i i think the us won't, we won't see those you might see high bank fees which will be effectively negative interest rate but uh you won't i don't think we'll see negative interest rates on treasuries or anything like that wow well it's it's important to to note that this is how central banks deal with uh, basically anything these days. I yep. mean, they have, they have this is their one tool, their hammer in their toolbox. Well, we're going to talk about the IRS versus Coinbase saga. It continues. If you uh, recall back in episode 138, we reported on the IRS phishing expedition targeting Coinbase users. And Coinbase posted a blog stating that they would be fighting the summons. The court sided in favor of the IRS. And then a Coinbase user stepped forward to intervene in the case as an intervener or And uh, attorney Jeffrey K. Burns of Burns Weiss filed a motion to quash the summons. The latest response from the IRS shouldn't be a surprise. The IRS states that Mr. Burns is no longer a subject to the summons as the point of the summons was to, quote, was to produce information revealing the identity of certain unknown taxpayers. Mr. Burns outed himself, according to the IRS, which in turn told Coinbase to remove Mr. Burns from the summons. As if anticipated, Mr. Burns released a response that starts out, quote, the IRS willingness to withdraw the subpoena as to Mr. Burns only because it is now aware of his identity makes it clear that the IRS does not have a legitimate purpose in seeking substantial personal and financial information concerning approximately 3 million Americans, unquote. So that's the latest. We'll see what happens next. Uh, I don't know how much longer they can really delay the summons. Um, they're going to get it. I think they're going to get it. They just have to find the judge that'll say yes, and they'll keep digging until right. they Right. I mean, it. they've already found one that said yes. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Airbnb. So the Airbnb CEO went on Twitter, and he, he posted tweets, uh, basically one asking, what do users want to see in the 2007 uh, versions of Airbnb that are going to come out? Of course, they're, as any platform, they're always looking to improve. And an overwhelming response was Bitcoin. Integrating Bitcoin payments would bring a lot of other users back into the fold and, and even make it an exclusive um, uh, option for many people who prefer to pay in Bitcoin. And um, some of the, the tweets pointed out that, well, I, I go to these hotels because I can pay in Bitcoin through this method, and that's why I'm staying there versus Airbnb. 
So uh, I think the Airbnb CEO got a, an earful or an eyeful. Yeah, I was reading through a lot of the tweets, and uh, he seemed to be really engaging and, and was quite surprised to see how sort of passionate uh, Bitcoin users were. And lots of comments, yeah, I use Expedia to book hotels, but right. we'd totally rather use Airbnb. And from the... Uh, <clears throat> from the rental side, from the person who's actually renting out their property, there were plenty of comments there as well about how much they would welcome this. And um, so I, I hope hope to see that, especially with uh, Airbnb's acquisition of the Change Tip team, as we reported on a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, them, hopefully they'll they've got some experts there with uh, blockchain yeah. backgrounds. So yeah, excellent. <laughs> uh, so er- earlier this week, I, I don't know, maybe it was a day or two ago. Um, Randy is, is, you know, his workstation's next to mine in the, ed- the editing room. And, and so, um, he's listening to this video from India about Bitcoin and it is like the, it's, it's like inside edition meets X files and like the, 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 the music is just this, this orchestral Deadliest catch. Yeah. Like, Oh my God, the world is about to be destroyed by an asteroid. And like this sort of tone and it's about Bitcoin, calling Bitcoin scam, online money laundering racket exposed. It's a propaganda video, as Neo Cash Radio listeners know from listening to our show. The past couple of weeks, we've been covering the India cash crunch, where uh, Prime Minister Modi has ordered all five hundred and thousand rupee notes, essentially eighty six percent of the country's currency, uh, to be turned in for new notes by the end of the year. Um, and so we've seen the gold price go up and the, or, or the gold demand go up in India, certainly, but we've also seen, uh, the Bitcoin price going up in India, uh, likely as a response to some of this. And so the, the government, India Today, one of the state owned media outlets, uh, put out this video that, yeah, just is basically just slandering, uh, Bitcoin and saying that it's black money and used to yeah. all these terrible things. Um, as if the U.S. dollar and the Indian rupee and any other fiat currency hasn't been the number one funder well, they, of these things for so long. The Indian rupee just was rendered null and void, so uh, they don't really have much to stand on. I mean, at least these certain notes. Now you right. have to trade them out, and, and you know, it's, it, as good as cash doesn't mean the same thing anymore. Well, yeah, but it's this whole undercover sting video, uh, you know, the way they've got it set up. The comments on YouTube were, were pretty telling. Uh, there's lots of thumbs down and... And most of the comments were just sh- shaming uh, India today for, you know, basically. Sh- oh, it's it's outright lies. I mean, it's the whole the whole focus of the video is is black markets, black currency, uh, money laundering, this sinister but that. If right? you have these notes, you can. Tr- there's a limit on how many you can trade in. Yes. So, right. So you gotta give them to somebody else. And if you don't, if there's nothing you want to buy right now, then buying Bitcoin or buying gold is a way. That you can preserve your wealth. Yeah. Yeah. So. Seeing the way the the media talks about these kinds of events in Venezuela and here in India, where people are just trying to preserve their own, uh, preserve a bit of their wealth so that they have food on the table or money for their kids. Like obviously, there's people who are doing uh, quote unquote illicit things with money all the time, but you're not going to be able to eradicate that. And you're just governments are affecting way more people than are you know, plenty of people who are just trying to carry about their daily lives. Right. Right. And they're being penalized for it and having money just taken away from them. But I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is like, it's, it's so overtly propaganda. Like this, there's, okay, look, the, the news media, and we, there's, there's a story from about Obama and the anti-propaganda bill being signed in the law. And, yep. and, and, you know, that big controversy that started because of the election and all of the, uh, the hacking and, and the email scandals. And at this point, it's, it's, it's like, there's there's been a lot of propaganda in the news. Obviously, there were a lot of news agencies that were pro Clinton during the election and leading up to it. There was a lot of favorable Clinton coverage and a lot of unfavorable Trump coverage. Mm-hmm. And then if you then you went to the news news agencies that were pro Trump and it was the opposite, and they were both spewing propaganda. Right? They were, they were cherry picking stories and in some some cases fabricating things altogether based on extrapolating or or uh, a lot of it was 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 talking about polling data and how that could be projected and how estimating things in the future and how people will vote and of course they were all wrong mostly you know it's like it's like so to have this come out about bitcoin and just be so overtly um propaganda it, it's it's like should i expect more of this from india or or from other areas not mm-hmm. just india right 
Like, is this going to be the new norm of like, stay away from Bitcoin? It's like, it reminds me of the reefer madness stuff. Mm -hmm. Like that sort of level of dramatic right. feel. One puff of a marijuana right. cigarette yeah. could kill you. Right. And so they, they tracked, they went and they bought Bitcoin from this dude. Now, I'm, mind you, I'm just listening to the audio. I'm not watching it. And they, they went in like a local Bitcoins thing and they met up with him and they had their undercover cameras and microphones surreptitiously recording, I'm, I'm sure. And, and it just, they treated it like they were doing a drug buy. They literally had this, this sense of you're buying drugs. Yeah, black money and like, again, the Ted, like, oh, and the, the, the shady man. Yeah. Just using all kinds of adjectives. It was really, yeah. It, it was so bad. Well, we, of course, will have the video up on uh, neocashradio.com, so that's you can right. check it out for yourself and have some lulls. Yeah, for the lulls. Well, a Harvard Business Review, last week we, we talked about the Huffington Post having an article about Bitcoin mining. Well, now the Harvard Business Review is joining the game, and they're talking about the blockchain, blockchain technology. Now, the article is entitled The Truth About Blockchain, uh, but... The article, it's it, what I, t I, I enjoyed reading parts of it. I didn't have time to read the entire thing because some of it was a little long-winded about the history of adoption, and I'll go into that. But my big takeaway was that the article described Bitcoin as less of a disruptive technology and more of a foundational technology, which I can see the merits of. I want blockchains in general, foundational technology, in, in that it's it's like... It makes sense that a blockchain can't really interrupt. It, it, it can disrupt, yes, disrupt the, uh, the normal banking scheme. But it's more about foundationally replacing the current banking scheme rather than just disrupting it. You know, it's, it's more like blockchains can create a lot of uh, assets and uh, functions and replace, completely replace the way things are done. Mm -hmm. You know, a complete evolutionary jump from paper and stamps to a blockchain where well, no people are involved. This sounds uh, like a pretty valid view. I mean, Bitcoin first came out in 2009. It's 2016 now. So in seven years, I wouldn't quite say the U.S. dollar has been disrupted right. or that traditional banking has been disrupted. Right. Right. I'm sure some of the banking services have been used uh, without the banks because of Bitcoin, but it's it's such a small proportion of what there is to do that it, it's, I wouldn't, it's nowhere near disruptive, but yeah, it's, it's, it's laying the groundwork for bigger and better things, hopefully. Definitely. And so the argument in the, that they, they usually, they take this point and then they make an argument based on this point that Bitcoin don't expect anything from it for years to come. And that, and then before they make that point though, they go back and they talk about the history of the internet and they talk about how TCP IP took a while to get involved and, and then, uh, how the backbone of the internet was built and then web pages evolved and, and how technologies evolved. And, and yes, that's all valid stuff. And those are all great curves to look at as far as the progression of technology. But I think to make the assumption that Bitcoin will take X years because this took X years or extrapolating based on how something else happened, I think is flawed. I think you, you can't look at it as if Bitcoin is going to overtake all of the system at once. It's not a light switch solution. What's going to happen more likely is it will capture small niche markets as we're seeing Airbnb, anything to deal with uh, online transactions. Bitcoin mm -hmm. is far superior. Mm -hmm. And the thing, my point is that it hasn't disrupted banking at all. What it's disrupted is tax collecting. And I think that's where the regulations and that's where the problems lie is when the tax agencies and the policymakers put pressure on banks to not deal with Bitcoin or to to uh, work harder when dealing with Bitcoin, that's when the banks actually stop working with the Bitcoin businesses and stop having Bitcoin customers because it's too much of a risk. There's, It's not the payoff isn't that great because mm -hmm. their profit margins are really thin. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I agree with the foundational aspect. I really like that look of it, but I don't think it's going to be years away i think it's happening already incrementally and more like an orga organism would and they're talking about like replacing a server like they're thinking of it in terms of the old technology of oh so i'm going to upgrade my server i'm going to replace this huge rack mount thing and uh bring in the new one when you should be thinking of it like replace my uh, my hard drive or my video card 
or my sound card, like all these little pieces rather than one big piece. So the system is being um, replaced slowly by Bitcoin and blockchain technology, but it's starting at the fringes like an organism, right? The, the vulnerable areas, the soft points, wherever it has least resistance. It only makes sense. And then as, as those areas get stronger, then the amount of resistance, you know, the amount of strength it can put into the, the force um, increases. So like that's my analogy for why I don't think that thinking of Bitcoin as a long-term thing, instead look at, think of it as a, a, a small bits and, and pieces of different things but they're kind of working together. I mean, sort of like a cellular structure. So yeah, it's a really interesting article. I'm I'm really glad it came up on the. Uh, I found it on Reddit earlier today, and uh, definitely recommend checking it out. We'll of course have it up on the blog. Excellent. So Randy, uh, before you go, I definitely wanted to take some time to talk to you about some of the latest things going on here at uh, the Fifth Cool Studios, Neo Cash Radio headquarters, and one of the things we've been doing or Randy has been doing lately, uh, has been cur- currency mining. And we talked to Pedro about it and uh, the, the home mining and things like that. But Randy, you've been doing something a little bit different lately, haven't you? Yeah, well, two weeks ago we had Pedro on, and uh, he's been helping us with, with cryptocurrency mining. Um, we've played around, and of course we're not advising uh, anyone to mine or buy or sell or anything. We're just talking about uh, what, what we're doing here just as an experiment we're curious to. Um, so we were mining some Ethereum previously, and uh, we switched over to Zcash after it was launched just to uh, play around. It's been really interesting to see how much the uh, mining al- algorithms have improved. I mean, when we first started with, uh, we've got five cards, and when they were going for Ethereum, they were making about 20,000 uh, hashes or guesses for the nonce per second. And then when we switched over to Zcash, it was about 20 guesses yeah, per second. Dramatic. And, yeah, we were like, whoa. Like a million a million times less, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> orders of magnitude, Darren. Yeah, five orders of magnitude. Yeah, wow. and in the uh, in the course of you know a uh, month and a half now, there's been several mining uh, possibilities that have come out. There's well, there's Claymore, and there's uh, there's a one called Optiminer, and I've just been checking them out to see which one kind of works best for for our setup here with the Zcash and. Um, you know, and just running some numbers, I started to look at, well, what about if I wasn't participating in a pool, uh, which is basically your miner is submitting, uh, all these guesses and the pool calculates basically how many shares you put in whenever a block is, uh, solved from the pool, it divvies up that reward among all the people that presented shares within that block. And, And so it gets broken up that way based on, you know, however many people contributed towards reaching that uh, solution with the solo mining, it's it's just me. So I'm still using a pool, uh, but it's a s- solo mining pool actually. So I, I using the software that we have, which is the uh, FOS, um, which also actually just added Monero capabilities as well. So using the software, we could do Ethereum, Zcash, or uh, Monero. Um, but using this luck, it's called a uh, luck luckpool.org. Um, basically, it's set up as a pool, but whoever finds the reward, instead of divvying it up amongst everyone, it goes to the person who found it. So it was a much easier way for me to set it up because I don't really understand Linux or any of that kind of stuff. Right. But, hey, I was able to plug and play it and, you know, log into to Luckpool. And so it's stati- based on the current difficulty and our mining power and the current network hash rate, we should statistically probably get one block mined within like 80 to 90 days but the reward is 10 zcash and as it was standing uh we were getting about 0.0 after the latest update we were getting about 800 we're now getting about 850 hashes per second so it's gone up dramatically i meant to get back to that uh, from 20 it's gone up to about 850 with the same hardware so it's just getting it, so before it was it was 120 solutions over the whole machine and then it jumped to 850 solutions over the whole machine right yeah so 20 per car to no it was uh, yes that's right it was 20 per car 20 per car to like 250 per car or something to, uh 180 something or something so yeah. it's it's improved quite a bit um yeah. but yeah so basically i was getting 0.08 that's going to, you know, that'll continue about 0.07, 0.08 a day. And so there's that regularity from being in the pool with those kinds of payouts, but just doing the math. I mean, if, if at this rate I am to get a block and it's very possible that after three months we won't like, that's the thing. It is a lottery. It's not like this is going to happen. It's just, it is random chance because your computer is just guessing random numbers. But you did the math. 
I, I did, mm-hmm. which is Darren's job. But yeah, I, yeah. I thought, you know, hey, I, I can roll the dice a little bit, so I'm going to give it the 90 days and see what we get. So basically you're saying that in, in the 90 days, the reward from solo mining is far greater than the reward from consistent uh, pool mining. It would be, yes. So if I do get just one block even, um, yeah, it would be better off than... Uh, than waiting out on the cloud, uh, on the pool mining. So it's something, yeah, I'm just going to roll the dice and see what happens and see if, if, if we do get some luck. And, um, but yeah, it was just something neat that I started thinking about and crunching a few easy numbers and still a better uh, investment than the lottery. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> totally. And, and the, well, the fact is he's, he's still, uh, you know, part of the network and, you know, and, running his own full node and right. mining node. And it's early enough. I'm, this is not something that would even be, but here's, I would never even consider doing something like this on Bitcoin or something where there's just such a massive number of people trying to get this yes. number. There's no way. I mean, you'd right. be very, 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 very lucky. I mean, <laughs> statistically well, improbable. And, and so these these uh, different uh, mining methods, were they put out by, like, companies? There? No, I... Well... It's tough to say. I mean, it's just someone who's posting often on GitHub or in the forums. Um, this was here like with, an individual might be working on this by themselves. That's what it appears to be. I th- um, there was one. Um, oh, well, I know like FOS on their updates, they list the number of developers that have worked on each one, and that's ranged from three to five, if I remember correctly. But on the actual mining algorithms, and Claymore is, as far as I know, is just a person, and that's their name. They go by Optiminer was one developer, uh, and those two have a developer fee built into them. So um they do it's unknown what the percentage is and that was some of the controversy there was like a little bit of an uproar with optiminer and he like pulled his code for a while but then put it back up and um you know it just it 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 varies but i i do believe it's just uh individuals or small groups of individuals that are doing these things there's uh silent army and heq minor um, so that yeah and and that's that goes back to my earlier point about the growth of bitcoin and blockchain technologies is that all it sometimes takes is one person writing a piece of code for this one simple operation you know what i'm saying and, and then optimizing that code and getting it better and faster and and, and just focusing on i'm just going to focus on getting more solutions per second at zcash mining and i'm going to go you know exchange it somehow with with whatever method you have and like those, just take that and extrapolate that out over millions of people doing this on different areas of with blockchain technology. I think that's more of a better way of looking at the growth that will come from the blockchain technology. But and just a reminder that you can tune into NeoCash Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome NeoCash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, Library, and more. Excellent. Thank you so much, Randy. And we look forward to your return from your, your vacation. But as always, you, uh, you can tune in, and hopefully Darren and I will be here to entertain you. But next week, we should be talking to Pedro again. So anyway, this is Neocache Radio. Tune in on our website at neocacheradio.com. This is JJ. Darren. And Randy. For Neocache Radio. Neocache Radio.